thank you for the introduction, Patricia. Um, Marquita and I are really thrilled with the response that we had to this event. We had 50 people sign up for this, and um, I think that's just a testament to the fact that there's obviously appetite for the content that we're going to go through today, and also for the support um, of Black Philanthropy Month uh, for Women's Impact Fund as a whole. So thank you for being here. Um, I think, uh, you know, before we get started, I would be remiss not to point out that this is uh, the 100th anniversary of the passage of the 19th Amendment and women getting the right to vote, but it wasn't for another 45 years uh, that all women got the right to vote. And uh, while there is some celebration in there, I think that that also shows that as we kind of peel back some of the layers of systems that we've been operating in for so long, um, we're really only at the beginning of understanding the type of social change that's needed to bring about racial equity. Um, so today, as Patricia kind of talked about a little bit, we're going to go through some major highlights from a paper that was published by Eklund Green and the Bridge Fan Group uh, just a few months ago, actually. And um, we're going to break out after we finish going through some highlights into the discussion groups. And then we're going to come back together and talk a little bit about Black Philanthropy Month um, more specifically. So um, excited to, uh, to jump in. Um, excuse me. So uh, just to give a little bit of background, um, Echoing Green is a, a seed funder of early stage organizations, and they also do leadership development of emerging leaders. And Bridgepan is a, a leading social impact consultant. And so they're talking to NGOs, um, philanthropists, uh, investors, and, and other advisors, and consulting with them on how to make the biggest impact in the areas that, are, that they're trying to to make that impact. And so together, these two organizations have really kind of a, a great complementary set of perspectives to dive into the topic of racial equity and philanthropy. And, uh, and this is what they say the focus of their work is in this paper. And the focus is to challenge the ways in which philanthropists work to change the world. And when I read that, uh, just like bells went off in my head because Women's Impact Fund's vision statement is a community of philanthropic women impacting the world. And so it just it sounds identical to, to what their focus is here and just said to me how relevant this is for the work that we do together. So I'm super excited to, to share this with you today. Um, you know, uh, before we jump into some of the major highlights, I, I just want to start with this concept of going from colorblind to, to race conscious. And there's a quote in the paper, failing to address race head on is counterproductive to making meaningful progress to correct society's startling inequities. While it may be easier to avoid discussing race, it's impossible to improve the systems that create these disparate outcomes if we don't first recognize it, how they disproportionately impact people of color. And I think, you know, when, when I look at this, um, you think about Martin Luther King's, uh, Martin Luther King Jr.'s famous dream, right? And the dream was for a society that didn't judge people based on the color of their skin. But it wasn't for a society that didn't see it. Because if we don't see it, we risk ignoring these race-based inequities that exist. But when we do see, then we are in a place where uh, equity can be realized. So, you know, going from colorblind to race conscious in the in the philanthropic space will allow us, right, to uh, to see these disproportionate outcomes and or disparate outcomes uh, for and and achieve better better results. Um, before we kind of jump into the philanthropic side, like the disparate outcomes that are spoken to in the paper, I just pulled four uh, four statistics out here to go through just to kind of lay the foundation for the fact that race is one of the most predictable, uh, one of the most reliable predictors of life outcome. The first two statistics here are, uh, you know, economic in nature. So African-American business owners are 5.2 times more likely to be denied a loan. Seven out of 10 black children born into the middle quintile, middle income quintile, they actually fall into the bottom or the second income quintile as adults, right? And the second two statistics here are actually in healthcare. 
Um, so African Americans are 2.3 times more likely to experience infant death. This is probably one that a lot of us have heard, but the fourth one is one that really, really hit home for me. And you know, white women with high school diplomas and or GEDs have lower infant mortality rates than black women with masters law degrees or PhDs. And you know what this last statistic says and what the seven out of 10 black children being born into that middle income quintile falling to the bottom two by adulthood, what those say to me is that when you control for that socioeconomic element, right? Or you control for that education element, these, these dis disparate outcomes, they're still there, right? And so I, I think that's kind of the important takeaway for this. Um, and as philanthropists, you know, it, it's up to us now know, knowing these disparate outcomes to look at our work and what we do uh, through a race-based lens to really understand if we're impacting populations equitably or even doing the work that we're, we're trying to do. And one of the examples that's brought forward in the, in, the, in the paper is on the topic of teen birth rates, right? And if you really look at this statistic, and all you did was say, wow, you know, the peak birth rate was in 91 and it's dropped 70%. And you could walk away feeling pretty good. Like we've had a huge impact. That's a, that's a huge drop, right? But when you start to dig under the surface, the reality is that that's just not the case, right? There are huge disparities between the impact of the work on different populations. You can see in this slide that white teen girls' birth rates are far, far lower than girls of color. I mean, in fact, you know, when you look at um, pregnancy rates for teenage girls of color today, they're actually about equal to the pregnancy rates of white teenage girls 15 years ago, right? Uh, and, you know, looking, looking at this and, and thinking about how we uh, design our programs, I think this is, a, is something that goes to show that you, you have to look through a, a race-based lens when you're, when you're actually designing, uh, designing your, your program, right? And, and so the, the example of Kaboom is put forth in the, in the paper too, but you know, Kaboom started because two children in Washington, D.C. were looking for a place to play on a hot summer day Right, and there wasn't any playground around, and they found this abandoned car. They hopped in, closed the door, the locks were faulty, and they died tragically of heat exhaustion. And Daryl Hammond was so moved by this that he started Kaboom because he wanted those children that were living, excuse me, living in in areas of poverty and and who are disproportionately children of color to have a place to go. And so he put these training materials online and social networking resources. And, um, and it, they were hugely successful, right? Lots of, pro of playgrounds were built. And then they actually did a study and they realized that in fact, even though lots of playgrounds were built, they were built in white middle and upper class neighborhoods because those folks had the resources and the capacity to take advantage of the model that Kaboom had set up. So, you know, they, they went through this huge exercise only to realize that like the, the work that he had tried um, so hard to do, the population that he was so committed to serving actually wasn't really being served at all. Um, and they came to realize that they needed to connect with those communities in different ways. Um, and that their assumptions about play spaces, what was needed in different neighborhoods was, was not always uh, right on. It wasn't a one size fits all model. Um, and so, you know, they were able to pivot, but this is sort of his moment where he says, until I confronted my own assumptions, the problem was me. I had to hear and see things differently to ensure that we got the impact that all of us so passionately believe in. Uh, so now that we've kind of gone through some of the, you know, disparities that exist, uh, some of the disparate outcomes in philanthropy, the importance of structuring programs through a race-based lens, I'm going to turn it over to Marquita because she's going to talk about, obviously, one of the more critical pieces here, which is the funding of these organizations. So, Marquita? Thank you, Ellen, and good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining. Um, what um, I want to start with is looking at the racial inequities in philanthropic funding. Um, currently, there have been four key barriers that have uh, been captured to identify capital faced uh, by leaders of color and just some of the um, ways in which they have challenges. 
Ellen has provided some very powerful and insightful statistics, even when well-grounded and meaningful attempts to equality are in place, which ignoring the implications of race and on the work that they have funded has only served to disadvantage people of color. I now plan to just kind of walk through these four key barriers faced by leaders of color and to determine how we may be able to support them. In an interview with more than 50 sector leaders, including nonprofit executives of color and philanthropic staff, studies found that leaders of color face multiple barriers, especially when funding or funders are not seeing race. Those four barriers are getting connected, building rapport, securing support, and sustaining relationships. And across each of these stages, repeated interactions with bias can cause leaders to adapt mindsets and behaviors that further limit their funding. So just to dive a little deeper into each one of these, getting connected to potential funders, leaders of color don't have the same access to social networks as well as their white counterparts, and therefore have fewer opportunities to connect uh, in the philanthropic community. While attempting to build rapport with potential funders, funders' interpersonal bias sometimes shows up as mistrust and or microaggressions, which inhibit relationships and building, uh, which create emotional burn burdens, excuse me, for um, leaders of color. Securing support for their organization, um, that's an area whereby funders often lack the understanding of the cultural relevance of the approaches as well as they may dismiss strategies and the methods of evaluation that they aren't familiar with. And so with that, um, sustaining those relationships with current funders for uh, people of color are sometimes often um, difficult and um, don't fully build trust and race conscious approaches. Even if they fund them, leaders of color are often uh, having to work harder to convince them that such approaches are working. And so this makes the grant renewal process more difficult, uh, resulting in an organization led by leaders of color uh, getting fewer unrestricted and longer term grants. And so I'd like to share just a, a quote with you that um, is actually from the Echo and Green and also Bridge uh, Fan Group, and that is, we're calling for two big changes in the world of philanthropy. Funders need to financially support more leaders of color and funders need to pay more attention to race conscious solutions. And that's something that um, kind of refers back to the point of uh, you know, just going from a transition from a um, just kind of uh, culture lens versus you know just looking at the uh, organizations individually. And that also focuses around the trust gap. Um, you know, average revenues for Black-led organizations are 24% lower or smaller than the revenues of their white counterparts. And when it comes to unrestricted funds, the picture is even bleaker. Um, the unrestricted net assets of Black-led organizations are 76% smaller um, than their white counterparts, despite focusing on the same work. The stark disparity in unrestricted assets is particularly startling, such as funding often uh, represents a proxy, if you will, for trust. However, uh, just to share another quote by Darren Walker of the Ford Foundation, um, funders must lean into trust, flexibility, and vulnerability, and are better positioned to achieve the change that they seek because they have true partners in their grantees who have freedom to direct and give feedback and capacity to deliver on the promise of a better world. And this is really um, another point when you look at the early stages of funding. Um, there's about a $20 million gap when you look at approximately 500 Black-led organizations um, raising in the same time span $40 million where 400 white-led organizations um, in the same time span would raise uh, approximately $60 million. 11% of big, bet, big bets for social change between 2010 and 2014 went to organizations um, led by leaders of color. 
So that is a very small percentage um, when, you, when you look at the fact that although the barriers that we described and discussed just a few minutes ago exist, um, even with the you know, most uh, qualified uh, organizations, um, the net result is, is starkly low. And so what I would like to do now is just kind of talk through the, the charge um, and read through um, uh, another quote. Um, this is um, from the Rakins Foundation, um, but what is here is very important for us to understand, and that is that they have challenged um, themselves to better understand the ways a race-conscious approach leads to better results for communities we want to support. There is groundbreaking work happening in organizations led by people of color, but white people's networks are also largely white. And so the fund, uh, funding goes to people that is known and also people who um, are, are known by their, their white peers. It means philanthropy is overlooking leaders of color who have most lived experience with and also an understanding of the problems we are trying to solve. And uh, the point here is that needs to change. As we prepare uh, to shift into our small group session, I'd like to share just one final quote with you, and that is from Representative John Lewis. And that is, when you see something that's not right, that's not fair, not just, you have to speak up. You have to say something and you have to do something. And what we're hoping is, um, as we have shared this information with you, um, we have three questions that we would like to um, provide to you just to give as thought starters. They're non-prescriptive um, and they will be within the chat, but I just want to take a minute and, and just walk through them just so that there's um, an understanding of some of the things that we're trying to capture here. So what do concerns and challenges of Black nonprofit leaders tell us about the larger nonprofit ecosystem? Local power dynamics, long-held beliefs, and structures at play. Big question, I know, but um, we wanted to make sure and put that one right up front. And then also just to begin to consider what does allyship look like between Black-led organizations and white counterparts? What does it require? And then also what are some lessons learned that could influence funding going forward? And that's more of a gen generic question um, that can be as it relates to women impact or, or just otherwise. Um, Again, these are non-prescriptive questions. We invite um, you to be, you know, very open as you're working with your facilitators through the group. And um, there will not be a summarization during this session of the feedback, uh, because we do have some other information to share with you. But above all, we would ask that you engage, enrich conversation, and, and have fun in that dialogue. And so at this point, I'd like to transition it over to Patricia uh, to just kind of walk us through our small group transition and, and instruction. And I think Ellen may be working on dialing in, um, but um, we can, we'll figure it out if we can't advance the slide. So I'll let you go ahead, Marquita. <laughs> yeah, and I can actually speak to um, this. So thank you, everyone. Uh, um, welcome back. Let me just say that. And it's my hope that each of your groups have very rich exchanges. Um, to begin to wrap up today's session, uh, I would like to share with you um, some information about Black Philanthropy Month, which is held nationally and internationally every August. It was created in 2011 as an annual global celebration of African descent and giving. And the primary aims of um, the BPM, I'll just call it, are to inform, involve, inspire, invest in Black philanthropy leadership and strengthen the African-American um, descent in all of its forms for benefit of our planet, our communities, and our organizations that we live in. Since it has been established, it has reached approximately 17 million people. And a new organizing concept frames the BPM campaign each year. And so the theme for 2020 is Foresight 2020. Um, the same hindsight 2020 suggests that it's easy to know what's right after the fact, yet our communities are calling on us to do what's right right now. This is even before the pandemic took its toll on our lives and our livelihood. While we can't predict the future with data and discernment, we can, however, make decisions and investments in what we want to see for people of color and both locally and globally. 
for everyone. The month of August brings into focus um, philanthropic power and giving clarity for the future. And so with that, um, locally, there uh, is a local partnership that's in place um, with NGAP, Share Charlotte, um, My Brother's Keepers, YMCA of Greater Charlotte, and also the National uh, Panhalic uh, Council of Charlotte. And on August 5th, um, the Women's Impact Fund um, participated in the event, uh, which was more of a funder and nonprofit networking event. And that allowed um, the, uh, and I should also say, we also sponsored a Google Meets room very similar to the ones that we had in our breakout session. And what that did was uh, allow for with, um, to meet um, people of color who are leading nonprofits, but also um, black led um, corporate and social organizations as well. Uh, in our meet room, there were eight Black-led nonprofits who joined, and there was an intentional opportunity to get to know each other better and also to create new relationships. And that kind of goes back to the um, four barriers that we spoke about earlier, um, just really trying to be intentional about creating um, those connections. Um, organizations and individuals um, who were interested in supporting um, their work were there, but we also had organizations who came to um, also share what they're doing uh, in their day to day. And so with that, um, after having participated in that session, um, we thought that this group, uh, or for, as a recognition of Black Philanthropy Month, um, holding this session would be a way, another way in which with could exchange with our membership and also um, just share some of the uh, awareness that the article provided. So with that, I am going to turn it over to Ellen uh, to close us out. So Ellen, can you hear us okay? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Wait, wait, wait. Whoops. <laughs> it's a very strange thing. I lost here all the all the sound from you guys, and I had no idea what was going on. Um, <laughs> Marquita, thank you very much, and thanks to everyone who participated. Um, I I had a, a wonderful discussion with our group, and I, I hope that you guys did too. And um, one of the things I think is important to leave everyone with is this idea that um, you know Black Philanthropy Month is is. It's being celebrated this month, but uh, Women's Impact Fund is committed to being a diverse and inclusive organization for the long term, right? So this is not just a, a kind of a check the box thing for us to participate here. Um, it's something that's very important to the organization and that we're committed to doing, and we want it to become part of a part of our culture. Um, and and so I just want everybody here to to know that. Um, and I also want to make sure that everybody is on the lookout for our newsletter, which will be coming out um, tomorrow. Is that right, Patricia? Um, Thursday. And, is that right? Yeah. Um, Thursday, yeah. We are going to be announcing uh, the grantees in that newsletter. Um, and we are also going to have some information about an exciting kickoff event. And I'll just tell you here that um, Valeda Fullwood, who is actually one of the architects of Black for Land Three Months, she's one of the folks that um, Dr. Jackie Bouvier Copeland brought in to help design this effort. And she's here locally in Charlotte. She's an author and a speaker, and she is going to help us kick off the year. We're super excited to host her for that. So um, there's information. There's a little bit of information on the website. I think you can uh, already sign up. It's uh, September 14th. So please be um, on the lookout for that as well. And I think with that, um, Patricia, if there's anything that we missed, uh, chime in but I think we're kind of wrapped up here early. Yeah thank you all thanks especially to Ellen and Marquita who um, wanted us to be able to have this conversation and to all of you for joining. I know um, the notice went out um, pretty close to the event so it's really great to see so many of you many members as well as a number of guests and familiar faces so um, thanks for joining us. Um, I hope you will um, if you don't already follow Women's Impact Fund on social media we have a lot of really trying to promote both the work of our Black Led and Black Supporting Grantees at Women's Impact Fund, as well as some of our members, as well as the other efforts around Black Philanthropy Month. Um, also give um, Share Charlotte and NGAP um, Charlotte a follow as well. Um, 
for just to continue following along with what's going on with Black Philanthropy Month. I know um, we've got Amy, who's a member, um, and also E.D. of Share Charlotte on the call with us, and they've just, they've had a tremendous collaboration. Um, and there was also, I'll, I'll commend a great piece in um, uh, QC Metro uh, last week as well about that collaboration that was really good. Mm -hmm. Amy, feel free to stick it in the chat if you want. Um, I'll also point you to our website. Um, we, um, over the next couple weeks, as sort of the year kicks off, as it were, we'll be updating a lot of our events and details. Um, and like I said, we'll be sharing details about that kickoff event. You can go ahead and sign up, but all the details about it, one which is on September the 14th, will come out in our newsletter on Thursday. So um, thanks to all of you for uh, being here. It's great to see you, and we will make the recording, um, not of the breakout sessions, but of the, the beginning and end of this available as well. Um, if you all would, would like to view it or share it with others.